So over the next several weeks in 635, um, we are going to be following the 100-day Bible reading challenge. Now, you do not have to be participating in this challenge to be able to participate here. Though, if you want to read along with the whole church, this is a challenge that we started in mid-September. Uh, and we're going to be reading for 100 days, just small, very short passages of scripture. Uh, and you can read it by yourself or with your family. But I thought that it would be cool to take all of the Wednesday scriptures, so whether you're following on along religiously or not, you can get a snippet of the readings here as we will read the scriptures for Wednesday nights together over the next several weeks. Um, and tonight, we're going to hang out with the book of Ruth, which is one of my personal favorites. So let's start with some trivia. How many, how, so number one, did you know, and here's the question, how many conversations between two women are recorded in scripture across the whole Bible, beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, how many conversations are recorded between two women? No. One. You got a little more. Across the whole Bible, there are only nine conversations that women share together that are recorded in Scripture. Nine. Guess how many of those are found in the book of Ruth? Five. <laughs> but here's some more trivia for you. All of those nine conversations involved one topic, the importance of men in scripture. But in the book of Ruth, the conversations did include that, but they included so many other topics as well, like each other's welfare, the conversations between a woman named Naomi, who we will meet, and Ruth. These conversations were, yes, about men, but about each other's welfare, and the day's events, and food, and so many other conversations. So when I was serving as the associate at St. Luke United Methodist Church in Sanford, North Carolina, I was tasked with rebuilding the women's ministry. And I had no idea where to begin except that the Spirit was calling me to read and reread the book of Ruth. And as I read the story of this magnificent relationship between these two women, I discovered a breadth, a wealth of information about what it looks like to be in, in deep, uh, committed friendships with people across difference, with people who are across different ages, intergenerational relationships. And I found a good foundation for what it looks like to live faithfully in this world through the context of friendship. So there are many lessons that we can glean from this entire book, but we are going to focus on the first chapter tonight. As we read this together, I want to hear from you, as we do, uh, about what you notice. But we're going to do it differently. There are two main characters that are in the book of Ruth. We have Naomi and we have Ruth. This section, you're going to place yourself in Naomi's shoes. I want you to think about and feel what it is like to live her life as described in the scripture we're going to read together. Think about what she might be feeling. Think about her future. Just be her. This side, you're going to be Ruth. You're going to place yourself in Ruth's shoes. What is it like to be her? What is she struggling with? What might her future look like? As we read together, and then we will share our responses. So here are these words from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. During the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. 
a man with his wife and two sons went from Bethlehem of Judah to dwell in the territory of Moab. The name of that man was Emelech. Em Elimelech. Elimelech, yes. And the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Shilon. Shilion, I'm not even concerned about that. They were <laughs> Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They entered the territory of Moab and settled there. But El Elimelech, whatever, Naomi's husband died. Then only she was left, along with her two sons. They took wives for themselves, Moabite women. The name of the first was Orpah, and the name of the second was Ruth. And they lived there for about 10 years. But, but both of the sons, Mahlon and Shilion, also died. Only the women were left, without her two children and without her husband. Then she arose along with her daughters-in-law to return from the field of Moab, because while in the territory of Moab, she had heard that the Lord had paid attention to his people by providing for them, food for them. She left the place where she had been, and her two daughters-in-law went with her. They went along the road to return to the land of Judah. Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go, turn back, each of you, to the household of your mother. May the Lord deal faithfully with you, just as you have done, just as you have done with the dead and with me. May the Lord provide for you, so that you may find security, each woman in the household of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. But they replied to her, No, instead we will return with you to your people. Naomi replied, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Will there again be sons in my womb that they would be husbands for you? Turn back, my daughters. Go, I am too old for a husband. If I were to say that I have hope, even if I had a husband tonight, and even more, if I were to bear sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you refrain from having a husband? No, my daughters, this is more bitter for me than for you, since the Lord's will has come out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth, Ruth stayed with her. Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law is returning to her people and to her gods. Turn back after your sister-in-law. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to abandon you, to turn back from following after you. Wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, as we dive into your scriptures, as we learn from these two powerful women, I pray that you would meet us and that you would teach us, and that we might hear all you have to say to us this evening. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So if you were Naomi, what are you feeling? Scared. Good. What else? Mm -hmm. That God was against her. Yeah, that God's actions were of malice toward Ruth. Yeah. What else? What else do you think? Yes. Profound loss. 
Absolutely. What do you think it felt like for her to tell her two daughters-in-law, the only people she had left in this world, to go back to their own families? How do you think that felt for her? Probably not great. Probably like she felt alone. And what did it feel like for Ruth to say what she did. How does that feel to you? Healing. Healing. Good. Any others from this side? Loved. Loved. Yeah. Blessed by God again. Blessed by God again. Yeah. All right. This side. What's it like to be Ruth? What do you think Ruth was feeling at the beginning of this story after her husband died and her uh, brother-in-law died and her father-in-law died? What do you think she was feeling? Lost. Lost. Good. What do you think she was feeling as she saw Naomi push her back to her family. Hmm? Rejection. Rejection. Sadness. And at the end of the story, when she made the stand by Naomi, what do you think she was feeling? Loyalty. Good. Conviction. Hmm? Empathy. Empathy. Good. She might have felt safer there. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So when you get married... You don't expect the worst to happen, do you? You think about all of the joyful moments, the children that you will bring, the home that you will build. You don't expect to get married to someone and then have to leave your home that you've known for years because of famine, because of hardship. And yet here Naomi was, married to the guy I, whose name I can never pronounce, having two small sons at this point. I, we can imagine. We don't know how old they were. But they packed up the ragtag family and made their way to Moab. As Israelites, to go to Moab, that was not a safe thing. It was a, a country that was hostile. Nothing good can come out of Moab. And so there Naomi goes with nothing except what she could carry and her two children, hoping for a better life, hoping to go to a place of abundance. And she had that abundance for a while. Her sons grew up. They got married to wonderful Moabite women. And then the famine hit there too. And then her husband died. And then her firstborn son. And then her only son. And there she was. As a woman. In a time where it was not safe to be a woman who was unmarried. Or without the protection of a man. And there she was. Responsible for two other young women needing to find food, wondering once again where their next meal would, would come from. And she hears that her hometown, Bethlehem, had food once again. And so she gathers her daughters-in-law and begins to make her way back. But as she did, she realized how hard this road is going to be for them. 
There was no one to protect these young women. The best bet was for them to find husbands. At this point, I bet that Naomi started to, to accept what the world was telling her about herself that she was only worth something if she was married or attached to a man. She was unprotected. Everything she knew was gone. She was grieving. All hope was gone. And so she says to her daughters, turn back, my daughters, go. I am too old, but you have hope. This is more bitter for me than it is for you, since the Lord's will has come out against me. She has brought, been brought so low that she is now blaming the God that she once trusted. How many of us have been there to that point where you were brought so low, where the hope is so far gone? that there is no future in sight, when it feels like the world just keeps knocking you down one thing after another. Doesn't this look like our world right now? We just prayed about it. The hurricane with massive destruction. What does it feel like to be owning a home that now is un un uninhabitable? To have to start over. Where's the hope there? Where's the hope when the last clump of your hair from the chemotherapy falls out and you have endless chemotherapy sessions to go? Where is the hope when the death of your spouse or your loved one or your children is so heavy on your heart that you don't even want to think about the next day? This Life is hopeless. Maybe this life is not worth living. And this was Naomi's reality. For Naomi, there was no one left. Everyone left. And she thought that she would be destined to be alone for the rest of her life. But Ruth... Ruth chose differently. Ruth made the hard decision to stay. And she did so with indignation. Our text translates it more softly. But if we look at the Hebrew that is written there, her response to Naomi sounds more like this. Your God is my God, and your people, they are my people. Therefore, where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. And it makes me angry when you urge me to abandon these commitments. In the strongest language possible, Ruth made it crystal clear that there is absolutely nowhere that she would want to be except by Naomi's side. Regardless of what lies ahead, regardless of the unknowns or the uncertainty, through thick and thin, Ruth chooses Naomi. Earlier in verse, let me look. When Naomi first talks to her daughters-in-law uh, in verse 8, she says, May the Lord deal faithfully with you. And then a few verses later in verse 13, when she says, uh, Goodness, hold on. This is more bitter for me than for you since the Lord's will has come against me. The language of the Lord's will 
and deal faithfully come from the same root word, hesed. We've heard this word hesed before. It, it, at its core, it is translated most faithfully as loyalty and loving kindness. So, hesed. This thing that Naomi is sure that God did not have for her, she was certain that Hesed would show up for Ruth. And yet, Ruth's response, her claim of Naomi, her willingness to step and stay and journey in the midst of the unknowns, this is the most clear representation of human hesed. And hesed is the, is the most natural, most very clear understanding of who God is. God's character remains steadfast in God's loving kindness. Sometimes when we are in the thick of it, we are unable to see God's hesed. And yet, we, if we are made in the image of God, also have the ability to exhibit chesed for others. And that is what Ruth did in saying yes to Naomi, to being willing to stand with Naomi through everything. Naomi experienced God's loving kindness through Ruth. And in this world of uncertainty right here and now, I believe that this is what this story is inviting us to this evening, as for us to lean into our capacity to exhibit divine hesed in the world, that we might be loving kindness in all ways to everyone, to make the choice to stand with someone who is brokenhearted, who has no hope, even if it looks like simply holding someone's hand or being present in the worst moments of silence. About a year and a half ago, when Steve and Catherine were on their sabbatical leave, I met a man named Daryl, and he was in a really bad car accident. And he was at Shan's, unable to speak with one of the ventilators on, but he was awake and he was alert. Now, some of you might know that pastoral care isn't on the top of my list of things that I absolutely love doing. It's hard for me because when I walk into those spaces, I have no idea what to do. And yet, I saw this man lying perfectly still with his eyes open, unable to speak or to communicate. And he was completely alone. And so I walk over to him, and we start figuring out a way of, of doing yes and no answers. And even still, that was really hard to communicate. So eventually, I just said, I am pulling up a chair, and I'm going to sit right here, and we are going to watch TV together. And so that's what I did. For about 35 minutes, we sat and watched a talk show. A couple weeks later, he had moved to a different unit. The ventilator was out. And I sat with him, and I asked him how he was doing. And he says, I remember you. It meant the world to me that you were simply there. Because no one was there. This is what it looks like to exhibit chesed in the world, to choose to sit alongside someone who has no hope. You don't have to do anything magnificent. I watch TV. And yet, by my presence, God's love was communicated to Daryl. Daryl ended up passing away a few weeks later. And I was blessed to do his funeral. And it was such a holy time. 
Friends, this is what the story is calling us to this evening. The invitation for us is to simply offer ourselves in any way we can to be present with people who are suffering, with people who feel like they have no hope, and I bet if you look back at your own life, you might remember a moment where Ruth showed up for you. So, as you enter into the world, may you know that God is with you, just as God shows up for others through you. Thanks be to God. Amen.